Look at this healthy crop of rice. I will have more than 1,300 pounds of rice per quarter acre. It was grown without chemical fertilizer, pesticides, or agricultural machinery. I stopped using those things more than 30 years ago. All I've done is sow the seeds and spread straw. Nature has done the rest. The man you just met is Masanobu Fukuoka, who farms and gardens in Japan. He's living proof that even though we live in an age of high technology and complexity, for living well at home, there's no substitute for the wisdom of simplicity. This is Vermont soil, a long way from those rice paddies in Japan. My name is Vic Sussman. And this is the way I found the garden when I moved here a few weeks ago. Certainly needs some work and restoration. But that's the problem that faces us as gardeners. How do we develop land so it will feed us and build our health while still keeping us in balance with nature? That's why Mr. Fukuoka's story, as told in his book, The One Straw Revolution, and in this film, has such special meaning for me, and I think for you too. Because he's moved towards simplicity by imitating nature. Instead of relying solely on technology, he's developed a philosophy and a set of techniques that allow nature to do most of the work. That's what I want to do here at my new place. Find a way to produce food and healthy soil while staying in harmony with the earth. Mr. Fukuoka has done this in his rice fields and his citrus orchard. Now, while I may not grow rice here, I know whatever I do grow will flourish if I can learn to trust and work with nature. Mr. Fukuoka doesn't use chemical fertilizer. He doesn't use pesticide. He doesn't plow his soil or even use prepared compost. He doesn't hold his rice fields in water all summer long the way farmers have done for centuries all over the world. His method requires less work per acre than any other, creates no pollution, and uses almost no fossil fuel. And yet Mr. Fukuoka's rice yields are as high as the most productive farms in Japan. When I first heard about Mr. Fukuoka, I was skeptical. There had to be more to it than just scattering seeds on unturned ground. And then I read his book, and I found that there was indeed much more to it. He grows a permanent ground cover of white clover. And then he spreads a straw mulch to enrich the soil and hold back the weeds. His crops sprout right through the clover. But instead of just telling you about these ideas, Let's go back now to Japan to visit with Masanobu Fukuoka. Mr. Fukuoka's farm is near the hillsides overlooking Matsuyama Bay in southern Japan. It's a rich farming area. The climate is mild with plenty of rain. Mr. Fukuoka was raised here in the village where the Fukuoka family has lived and farmed for more than 1,400 years. He grows about two acres of rice and barley and has a 12-acre orchard of mandarin oranges. This may not seem like much, but in Japan, where field sizes are small, it's considered a large farm. A national highway passes through Mr. Fukuoka's fields. An overhead railroad track has also been built, but is not being used. Students come from all over Japan and the world to learn from Mr. Fukuoka. Attracted by his reputation as a teacher and philosopher, and because he's the leading spokesman for natural agriculture in Japan today. The students live in mud walled huts in Mr. Fukuoka's orchard. They help with the farming chores. Most arrive unannounced, not knowing what to expect. They stay for a few days or a few weeks and move on. Some, remain for as long as several years. There are no modern conveniences. Students carry drinking water in buckets from the spring, cook meals over a wood-burning fireplace, light their huts with candles and kerosene lamps. <laughs> they live entirely on food they grow themselves or gather nearby. Wild herbs, vegetables, and fruit, fish from streams and ponds. 
They work hard from early morning each day. Their jobs vary with the season and the weather. The more the farmer increases the scale of his operation, the more his body and spirit are dissipated. He falls away from a spiritually satisfying life. A life of small-scale farming may appear to be primitive, but it allows me to study the great way. I believe that if one deeply understands the everyday world in which one lives, the greatest of worlds will be revealed. Mr. Fukuoka purposely has his students live this way because it helps develop the sensitivity necessary to tune in to nature's subtle voice. His philosophy is inspiring and has helped many people understand how they may live more thoughtfully here in America. Masanobu Fukuoka's farm is a rich mixture of trees, shrubs, herbs, and vegetables growing in a ground cover of weeds and clover. Chickens run freely foraging beneath the orchard trees, turning out the kind of eggs that can't be bought in stores. Goats are raised in the orchard too. The whole system works in harmony. Besides a traditional organic garden near his house in the village, Mr. Fukuoka grows vegetables in the spaces between the orchard trees. He mixes the seeds of cabbage, turnip, carrot, soybeans, cucumber, and many other vegetables and sows them in the spring. Then he cuts the clover and spreads the clipping over the seeds as mulch. Some vegetables go unharvested. They reseed and come up by themselves year after year, just as tomatoes, pumpkins, or corn will do in any garden. Mr. Fukuoka hasn't always lived on the farm. As a young man, he left his village home to be trained as a microbiologist. He worked in a laboratory in Yokohama as an agricultural customs inspector. Then, when he was 25 years old, Mr. Fukuoka had a flash of insight. He suddenly realized the perfect balance and abundance of nature. I can still remember it was the morning of the 15th of May. A night heron appeared, gave a sharp cry, and flew away into the distance. In an instant, all my doubts and confusion vanished. Everything I believed in was swept away with the wind. I felt that I understood nothing. My spirit became light and clear. All my agonies, dreams, and illusions disappeared. Something one might call true nature stood revealed. From the experience of that morning, my life changed completely. Despite the change, I remained a simple, foolish man. And there has been no change in this from then to now. Mr. Fukuoka saw that problems arise when people think they can improve on nature. So he decided to leave his job and return home to test his ideas in his own field. At that time, modern technology and chemical agriculture were just being introduced in Japan. The combination of machines and chemicals allowed Japanese farmers to get about the same yields as before. But the work was cut by half or more. It seemed like a dream come true. And in one generation, almost everyone had switched to chemical agriculture. It wasn't so apparent then, as it is now, that the new system caused pollution and depleted the fertility of the soil. Masanobu Fukuoka imitates natural processes as closely as he can. He cooperates with nature instead of struggling to overcome it. Let's see now how Mr. Fukuoka's close to nature techniques work in his rice fields. Mr. Fukuoka coats his rice seed with clay, forming tiny pellets before sowing them. Years ago, he tried throwing the rice seed directly onto the ground, the way it would fall naturally. But birds and insects ate much of the seed, or it rotted before it could germinate. 
Then Mr. Fukuoka got the idea of coating the seeds with clay, pelletizing them, thus preventing birds, mice, and slugs from eating the seeds before they could sprout. Ingenious. To make the pellets, the seed is soaked overnight and then mixed with clay. Then it's pushed through chicken wire and allowed to dry in the sun for a day. Ideally, there will be one seed in each pellet. It's possible to make enough pellets in one day to seed several acres. The rice seed pellets are sown right into stands of ripening barley about three or four weeks before harvest. Growing both rice and winter grain like barley in the same field every year helps to control weeds by never letting the land stay idle. It's always too full of rice or barley for weeds to get established. It's also an efficient way to use land. Despite the intensity of double cropping, the soil improves every year because Mr. Fukuoka returns all the rice and barley straw to the soil, which digests it into rich, fertile topsoil. The rice seed sprouts from the pellets about 25 days after sowing, just as the barley is mature and ready for harvest. The barley is harvested near the end of May. The rice seedlings are trampled by the feet of the harvesters, but soon recover. The usual way to develop a plan is to ask, how about trying this, or how about trying that? But that approach only makes the farmer busier. My way was opposite. I was aiming at the pleasant, natural way of farming, which makes the work easier instead of harder. How about not doing this? How about not doing that? That was my way of thinking. I finally reached the conclusion that there was no need to plow no need to apply fertilizer, no need to use insecticides. In fact, there are few agricultural practices that are necessary at all. It really comes down to a series of simple tasks. Scattering seed, spreading straw, harvesting. But it's taken him more than 30 years to reach this simplicity. Mr. Fukuoka's neighbors also plant barley using modern techniques. After harvesting their barley by machine, they burn the barley straw in the fields. To them, the straw is a nuisance because it gets caught in the machinery when they plow the field for rice. Mr. Fukuoka considers his barley straw a resource. He harvests all of it. After the grain is threshed, the straw is spread over the field as a mulch to keep weeds down and to return fertility to the soil. He's found that it works best if the straw is scattered every which way, just as it would have fallen to the ground naturally. The decaying straw also makes a good germination bed for the rice. Mulching is a most valuable technique for gardeners everywhere. It insulates the soil against extremes of hot and cold, conserves water, reduces weed growth, and ultimately decays into humus. When it's time for the neighbors to plant rice, they grow rice seedlings in a starter bed, then transplant them to the main field. They keep their paddies flooded all season long to help keep weeds in check. But these steps are eliminated in Mr. Fukuoka's straw mulched field, which you see in the foreground. Mr. Fukuoka also floods his rice fields, but only for a week or 10 days. This weakens the weeds and clover and allows the rice to sprout through. The idea is only to discourage the weeds, not eliminate them, since they are habitat for beneficial insects. If the clover were not set back right now, it would become strong enough to compete with the rice. Do you see the rice seedlings and the clover and straw? Once the water is drained, the clover recovers, but only after the rice has become strongly established. Every few years, Mr. Fukuoka spread some chicken manure to help decompose the straw. He used to let ducks loose in the fields. They ate weeds and left manure all over. But construction of the National Highway made it impossible for the ducks to get across the road and back safely. 
He now uses manure from a neighbor's chicken ranch. A lot of people come to visit Mr. Fukuoka's farm. Lately, scientists and agricultural experts have been among them. But these specialists usually see only from the point of view of their own expertise. And few grasp the deeper meaning of Mr. Fukuoka's methods, his close to nature philosophy. It is now midsummer, and the neighbor's rice is growing in neat rows. Weeds have been eliminated by herbicides. In August, Mr. Fukuoka pulls a rice plant from his field and one from a neighbor's paddy. The roots of the rice plants grown in the herbicide treated flooded paddy, shown on the right, are rotten and black by midsummer. The roots of the rice from Mr. Fukuoka's field, on the left, are still healthy and growing strongly. Mr. Fukuoka is probably the only farmer in Japan who doesn't grow rice in a flooded field all summer. Instead, he allows the roots of his plants to penetrate more than three feet into the ground. As they grow, they bring up minerals from the subsoil. When they decay, they enrich his land with nutrients and organic matter. To control leaf hoppers and other troublesome insects, most Japanese farmers spray a strong pesticide two or three times during the growing season. This poison also kills beneficial insects, to say nothing of the danger for the farmer. Mr. Fukuoka doesn't use pesticides of any kind. Many insects, earthworms, and small soil animals live in harmony with each other in his fields. Make your way carefully through these fields. Insects, spiders, frogs, and dragonflies are everywhere. Moles and earthworms live under the ground. This is a balanced rice field ecosystem. Insect and plant communities live in harmony. Often, a plant or insect disease invades this valley. My crops are completely unaffected. Mr. Fukuoka knows that every insect, even those most gardeners consider pests, has an important role to play. He believes that nature can and will control diseases and insects if we grow healthy crops in a biologically diverse environment. I talk about a do-nothing way of gardening. Some of you come here thinking life will be soft and easy. But you cannot sit back and expect nature to do the farming. I call that abandonment. People tamper with nature, thinking they can improve it. This causes negative side effects, which are more difficult to repair. Almost all the work in farming is created in this way. Work is important, but my farming is designed to eliminate unnecessary work. In September, a typhoon lingered off the Japanese coast, causing wind and heavy rain for several days. Mr. Fukuoka went to the fields to see how his rice was doing. The rice was just blossoming and I was worried that the flowers would be blown off before they could be pollinated. I knew I couldn't do anything about it anyway, but I couldn't help examining the heads of grain. I shouldn't be worried, only pray and accept my fate. Human beings can never hope to understand nature, but my analytical mind still tries. I try to garden as closely as I can to nature. My techniques are still evolving. I try to achieve a pure state of mind, and yet at 65 years, I still have many imperfections. Clover seed is broadcast in the fields about three weeks before the rice harvest. The clover seeds are so small that you only need a few handfuls for a quarter acre. The barley seed is also broadcast among the ripening rice plants about three weeks before the harvest. The barley seed can be seen among the straw and clover. The rice grown with chemical fertilizer in the typical paddy grows tall 
but topples easily late in the season. Mr. Fukuoka's rice plants don't grow as tall as those grown with chemicals, so more energy is available for seed production. The neighbor's rice has about 125 grains in each head. Mr. Fukuoka's rice has 225 to 250 grains in each head. His yield is about 1,300 pounds per quarter acre, comparable to the yields of modern commercial agriculture. The rice harvest season is a joyous time. In celebration, the village shrine is carried through the streets. Most of the farmers in the area harvest their rice with modern machines. Mr. Fukuoka's harvest is done by hand. His students don't mind. They enjoy the silent harvest using traditional hand tools. At the time of the rice harvest, the barley is already sprouting beneath the rice. After the rice is harvested and threshed, the rice straw is scattered over the field, just as the barley straw was scattered six months before. And with that, the yearly cycle is complete. My way of gardening is pleasant. I have time for the important things in life, like writing poetry, singing, and participating in village life. I have lived in this village nearly all my life. My wife and I raised five children here. We enjoy the company of our neighbors and the richness of our lives. I have made mistakes in the past, but they were not really mistakes. They were hints which helped me coexist with nature. A life of small-scale farming or gardening may seem behind the times, but such a life offers many opportunities for greater awareness. It doesn't matter how the harvest will come out. Just sow seeds and care tenderly for plants and soil. You'll have joy. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. <laughs> 